Hello, Dr. Luis Eber, and thanks for accepting my invitation for this interview for the Reproducible Research Scout YouTube channel. Let's start with your introduction. So, hi, Hanyeri. Uh, so, like I said, my name is Luis. I'm, uh, I did my PhD at uh, the University of California, Davis in computer science. Nowadays, I'm a computational biologist at 10x Genomics, but I'm I, I live in Davis, California, but I'm from Brazil, just like Juniel. And uh, back in Brazil, I did uh, work in in the National Institute for Space Research with climate models. So, yeah, that's you have a kind of from computer science to climate and to genomics. No, oh, what the thing that I, I I like to do is kind of be some sort of catalyzer. I like to accelerate other people's research. So like I, as a, a computer scientist, I really like to understand what are the problems that people are having and how to make them faster and easier to, to debug or to yeah. analyze. So and to make things faster, that's why now you're the Rust wizard, right? Uh, yeah, I, I love Rust, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Python too, but yeah. <laughs> So how do you define reproducible research and why is it important for you? Uh, let's say, I would say reproducible research is uh, kind of a, an end goal to be able to have proper scientific research because you must be able to reproduce the results of your analysis and what, what of your hypothesis. And, Reproducible research in the computational sense, I think it's one of the easiest ones to achieve, considering, for example, in biology, doing reproducible research is much harder if you need to go to the lab and pipette and get all the right materials, all, all the samples and so on. So once people start moving to doing more data analysis and comp computational uh, things with, with their data, I think that's the, the thing, like reproducible research becomes easier and also becomes your superpower. Because yeah. if your research is reproducible, you can also go back and change parameters and reanalyze your data pretty fast. And so that leads to better hypotheses and better research in the end. That's, that's very interesting, very powerful. So my impression is that reproducible research is uh, has different levels ish in terms of adoption in different fields and genomic is a field that is in the frontier of reproducible research in terms of more people are doing or at least it's more mentioning for you have been working in genomics what's your impression yeah i i think it ends up being kind of the frontier of using uh of, of doing reproducible research just because it the amount of data that's being generated in genomics is growing and growing and so it kind of becomes a necessity because you don't have enough people to throw at the data to analyze it and the researcher that's that's moving from doing a wet lab experiment like a biologist and have they they then need to analyze their data and they need to have some sort of computational support to be able to do that quickly because it easily becomes unattainable to do if you don't have efficient methods to go through all this data and and analyze it and reach your 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 research goals your testing your hypothesis and well even doing exploratory research like sometimes you you just see, for example, the in the genomics field, there is every time you do a sequencing experiment and publish a paper, you need to deposit the sequencing data in a public database. So one of these databases, the Sequence Research uh, Archive, maintained by NCBI, nowadays is approaching 55 petabytes of data. And even if you're not doing like wet lab research, that's all public data that you can also go and analyze, but you need good tools to be able to go through 55 petabytes of data. So 
I think it's a lot of pressure as the scientific area becomes more data intensive to do more reproducible research as a way of automating your research and reaching uh, results faster. So from what you say, my impression is that if you want to make other fields more reproducible, we need to start uh, unlocking all the tiny CSV files or Excel files that people have on their computers and USB stickers and so on on their desks and putting on the cloud. Yeah, definitely. Like all the, the large scientific areas that kind of went through this transition already, like astronomy is one, high energy physics is another one that's the, the telescopes and the particle accelerator, they generate so much data that you need a, a lot of infrastructure to be able to capture all that data and be able to process, but also on sharing that data so people can benefit from, from the results and going from like terabytes and terabytes of images from a telescope to the distilled uh, data that become, sometimes it even becomes a CSV or like a, a JSON file with a, a bunch of like coordinates of information about a galaxy or, or so on. So, but you need to go from this very large image or collection of images to something that you can process and analyze later. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that some researchers, for example, in genomics, every day or every week, they get a new sequence to align and process. And how is that they do that? Like how they automate this? Uh, usually, it depends. Like there are many models to get sequencing data. One of the most common ones is uh, what's called a, a core, a, a sequencing core. So it's usually the core is the people in the university that are operating the sequencers. And so what they receive is a sample that's already prepared for, for sequencing, or sometimes they even do the preparation themselves. But I think it's more common for like the researcher to prepare the sample for sequencing. And so they run through the sequencer, they process the sequencer outputs, and deliver a bunch of raw sequencing data, usually in a FASTQ format, which is a text format with like a pretty basic formatting. It's like four lines, one with an identifier, then the genomic sequence, a separator, and then the quality for each base of the genomic sequence. So after that, it's kind of like you choose your adventure on how to do that. You can use a, a your, your own pipelines with stringing a lot of programs together with bash scripts or something like that to process your data. Uh, you can send to, there are public websites that can process the data for you. There are commercial services also that you can upload your raw data and then they will process through some sort of pipeline that they have defined. But yeah, most of them involve some sort of pipeline because a lot of research in computational biology happens on method development. So people develop a method for being able to go from raw sequence to trim your data or quality control your data, or then you, you might want to do some other operation. But what ends up happening is that you have a lot of small programs and you need a way to put them all together to generate the final result that you actually want. So it's not uncommon to have pipelines that have 10, 15, 20, or even more steps in between, and they are all different programs. So in the beginning, there weren't that many systems that were good for building those pipelines. So people did a lot of shell scripts or pro scripts to be able to call all these programs and get the outputs and put to the next one and string all together. Nowadays, luckily, we have workflow systems that take care of a lot of this complexity with the drawback that you need to get a bit used to, like what's the terminology or how these things are architected. So you're, you're better able to use all the features that they have. Cool. In terms of 
workflows of uh, imagine we were talking about like sequence someone got the sequence and the deep cleaning and then the processing and then you get the final alignment uh but also you can imagine like someone got email and then email needs to be filtered over spun and to get to the final user most uh, it ends up being like workflows as you mentioned and some technology media have been talking about no coding platforms how is the thing for genetics like are you reaching the no coding status as well or people there, to... there is a, a, a very large piece of software that's called uh, galaxy in in genomics or like yeah in, in sequencing data analysis in general uh and it's kind of funny because they kind of push both the the workflow side of developing and packaging tools to generate these pipelines as well as more closer to what no code i i think means where you put together all these boxes yourself and you don't need to know exactly how things work underneath or how to schedule these things to run and so on and galaxy is a fairly old project it, old it's probably 10 to 15 years uh old but it 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 was a huge contributor to this idea of workflows and popularizing the the development i don't know exactly how much you can go to the no code part especially with research because many times you need to have some sort of special processing that's not available in the platform yet and then the question becomes what's the escape hatch that you have to implement those parts so if you go for, for a pure no code platform like can i implement parts of that pipeline if it, they are missing do i need to wait for contact a company that's developing as a product to be able to implement that so uh, th there's always this tension of like having the what people kind of jokingly, jokingly call the push button nature paper where you gather your raw sequencing data and there is a magical button that will process everything and generate the final paper for you that you just submit to nature or science or one of these big journals and there's dangers in that of people not understanding what the pipeline is doing but also that there are many details that only the researcher knows and probably are not encoded in the pipeline yet so it's a tension of what's already available how you best use it but you also need to understand how these things interact so you know what are the possible failure modes of of the software or the solution our time is running a little bit out. Uh, there is any project that you want to share with us? Uh, projects in terms of workflow managers, one that I really, really like is called SnakeMake because it, it kind of fits my way of developing pipelines. You can start very simple. At, at the simplest case, it looks a lot like a, a make file, but since it's simple, like it's it gets turned it's a python dsl it gets turned into python code for executing you can import python code and libraries and change the way it behaves it has support for running in clouds for for parallelizing your research it has contain, containerization and can use cone environment so it has a lot of features but you don't need to use or know of them to have very good results of automating your data analysis uh, as for personal projects my my main computational method is called sour mesh which is implemented in python and rust for the the fast parts and that's the stuff that i mostly works for my my on my my free time nowadays <laughs> and yeah I guess that's yeah. It's, it's the second time that someone mentioned uh, snake make. Mm. Uh, uh, Vinicius also mentioned that he was been using to orchestrate things. So uh, I mean, the, cool it, project. 
Yeah, it's an ECMAC is cool, but it, I think it's a very good introduction to the concepts of a workflow. There are many other workflows. So Nextflow is another one that's also very good. And CWL, which is a project for kind of unifying all the different workflows and become like kind of an assembly language. So like all the workflows can compile down to CWL and then you can execute anywhere. But so, but yeah, I like Snake Make because I think it's a good intro to all the concepts around okay. workflows. Okay, thank you, Luis, uh, for your time and this joyful conversation. Uh, I hope that you have a good evening and big success on all your projects. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Bye. -bye.